Good morning. morning. We've been blessed with some nice summer days. We ask the Lord to be with all of us as we look at the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, looking at some challenges from the Lord to put our faith into action, to find that pattern of life that helps accent our witness to Christ. On Sundays, we do have adult Bible study. We'll be going through some of the heroes of faith. Next week, we'll be looking at Rahab. There's a fellowship after each 745 service. We certainly invite you to be part of that. There are cookbooks for sale from the Women's Ministry Project downstairs in the fellowship hall after services. On the back of your notes on those green sheets, There are some prayer opportunities for those who are going to the National Youth Gathering and those individuals who will be commissioned this morning during the service, the youth as well as the youth advisors and adult advisors. So we're glad they can gather here today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we can make confession of our sins together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all people. Have mercy on us, kind Father, because of the obedience of our brother, Jesus Christ, your Son. Forgive us all that is past, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, move us to serve you faithfully. Set our feet upon the new path of life, and build your kingdom here through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn to him. You are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May he keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit, lead you to greater faith and obedience, and bring you to live with him forever through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Psalm 126, a psalm of restoration and hope. When the Lord brought us back to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. Indeed, he did great things for us. How happy we were. Let those who wept as they planted their crops gather the harvest with joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in your deep compassion, you rescue us from whatever may hurt us. Teach us to love you above all things and to love our neighbors as ourselves. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Good morning. You can find our lessons today in your worship folder. The first is from the Old Testament lesson in Leviticus 19, verses 15 through 18. The Lord is concerned that we treat our neighbor fairly and with love. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle for this Sunday is taken from Colossians 1, verses 3 through 14. The apostle Paul is overjoyed to hear how the good news of Jesus has impacted the Colossian church. He prays that they continue to grow and mature in faith and understanding. We begin. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Ephraphus, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel from St. Luke, the 10th chapter. Jesus uses the question of the teacher of the law to teach a great truth about who is our neighbor. We'll be sharing this responsively this morning. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. 
A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he said, put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. This morning for our creedal statement will be Karen Stainbrook. Please come forward. On the night the confirmation students had their essays, Karen had a commitment that she couldn't break. So she agreed to, to read for us, which is really great that she'll share some things about her faith. I chose the question, how does knowing you are forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ help you love and live with other people? To me, this means that it's not through works, but through our faith, that Jesus helps us live and love with others and helps us through tough times. To me, the answer is that knowing you are forgiven can help you realize that you are lucky and that you should help others to come to faith and help them with their earthly lives. It also helps you forgive others and not hold grudges for other people's actions. It might also help you try to cooperate with people who you might not have wanted to speak to for any reason present in your dilemma with that person. Doing these could help your relationships with others on earth and getting their spirit to heaven with our Father. So our God, sending his one and only Son to save us and to forgive others of their wrongs and things that have offended you and or your family and friends. One other thing that this question could be answered with is that we should stand up for our faith as others have, like Jesus did. So all in all, this question can be answered with that we are that we forgive others of things done or said wrong, and it means to me that we are forgiven by our faith and not by our works. Thanks, Karen. The children come forward for the children's message as Martha shares with you. Good morning. We just heard a couple of different scriptures read from the Bible, and the one that we heard from Colossians had three times in it where it talked about praying. That book, Colossians, was a letter written by Paul to the people in the city of Colossa. And that city is an area now that we call Turkey. And he said in there that we thank God, that's how we started out, that we thank God for you when we pray for you. Then he also said, we've not stopped praying for you. And then in verse 10, he says, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. So three times in there, he talked about praying for the people. Do you have people that you pray for? Yeah? Who do you pray for? Sometimes one of the things that people do is make a prayer list. So let's make a list. Who do you pray for? What do you think? Who do you pray for? Who do you pray for? Ah. Ah. Pray for things that you'd like to have? Okay. Anybody, anything else or anybody else? Do you pray for your parents or your friends? Your grandparents? Any of those people? Yeah? Well, those are some people we could pray for. Grandparents, brothers and sisters, 
parents? Do you know anybody who's been sick? Is that somebody who to pray for? Or maybe they've hurt something, maybe they hurt their elbow or their knee or their ankle. We can pray for those things too. And we can also pray for people that our church prays for. We have letter, these newsletters on our bulletin board from two families, the Bakers and the Youngs, and these are people who we pray for and we help support them as they share God's word in other countries. The Youngs in Ethiopia, they're getting ready to leave for Ethiopia, and the Bakers in uh, Kazakhstan. So all, they're sharing God's word in other places. Do you think we could sh also pray for those people that they're going to talk to? and people that don't know about Jesus? Yeah, we can pray for those people too. Is there anything in the news that we could pray for? Sometimes we might hear that there was a fire or um, some difficult thing that happened. What? Oh, okay, there was an accident or a, a fire in the race, at the racetrack? In the parking lot at the racetrack, okay. Yeah, so things like that that we see, or maybe we hear an ambulance go by, or a fire truck. We could pray for the people that were involved in that fire or that accident. We can pray for all of those people. Do you think God thinks that prayer is important? Yeah, do you think Jesus prayed? Yes, that's right. Yeah. There's a lot of places where it talks about Jesus praying before things happen. He prayed before he uh, made the loaves and fishes to feed all the 5,000 people. He also taught a prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer to the disciples, didn't he? And we can always pray that. And that covers a lot of different important things. That's why Jesus taught them to pray it. So we have many things that we can pray for, and prayer is important to God. God knows those things that we need, but he wants us to ask, just like your parents want you to ask when there's something that you need. And this weekend, we also have this list on the back of our bulletin notes with each day, the 10th is today, and all the days until our youth get back from the youth gathering on the 21st, there's something to pray for or people to pray for each day. So we'd love for you to take one of those and, and pray for us while we're gone. And so today, as we close, we're going to um, pray for the people that we put on our list. And we also want to remember that sometimes there are people who need help, just like in the story of the Good Samaritan, but we're not walking down the road next to them to help them, but we can pray for them, even though we can't reach out and actually touch them and help them with the thing that they need. So we'll include that as well. So... Will, will you pray from, with me, and then we'll hand out the sheets. Dear Jesus, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We know that you want us to pray for others. So we ask that you would be with our grandparents, our brothers and our sisters, with our parents, with all those who are in need of healing or are celebrating special days today. And we pray for all the things that we need, that you would provide them for us, even toys and things that are fun. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, prayer is just talking to God. We don't have to have any special words or anything, so everybody can do that.
May the love of God our Father, the hope of Christ our Savior, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to die to get there? I'm sure some of you are saying, yes, I'm willing to do that, but maybe not right now. But the ultimate goal of being a Christian, obviously, is getting to heaven, to be in that final, complete kingdom of God. Our relationship with Jesus Christ brings us into the kingdom of God. We pray about in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. We're in the kingdom, but we want the kingdom to keep increasing, growing, and obviously we're praying towards the ultimate that the complete kingdom of God would come in eternity. And we want to be there. As the saints march in, we want to be there with them. Our text from Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins allows us to be linked with our Lord. And as we are forgiven and believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are part of his kingdom. Throughout the Old Testament, the Lord said, you are my people. I've loved you. I will never forsake you. You are mine. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. The Lord really wants us as part of his family, and he makes it so clear and continually over announces that for us. He also gave some symbols to the Old Testament people that he expected things from them, a relationship. And here are the Ten Commandments, not suggestions, commandments that I expect of you that will keep your life in order. He didn't do it just to limit our life. He did it to increase our freedom so that we would know and be free in knowing when we are serving God, when we are doing what he'd like us to do, when we're living out our purpose that we're staying within our mission. He also gave them something called the tabernacle, a traveling church, if you will, with all the elements of the temple, the holy of holy places, a place to sacrifice, that was a foretelling of the great sacrifice. What's the great sacrifice? Jesus Christ on the cross. But the tabernacle led them to know they would need a substitute someday, especially on the Day of Atonement, when they had to remember they needed to be atoned. God rescued them using an animal in the Old Testament as a symbol, but obviously Christ in the New. But then the temple was built. Do you know which king got to build the temple? David couldn't do it because he had too much blood on his hands. Who was allowed to do it? Solomon. And so Solomon built the temple, and you'll see it has many of the same dimensions as the tabernacle. But now it's permanent. So the people of Israel are happy. We can go up to Zion, to Jerusalem, and there is our God. It was important to them that they had a permanent place in which they remembered God. Did they need that? Not really, for God's in our hearts. He's present everywhere. But it is important at times to mark a place and to have a place where we can gather and reaffirm God's promises, not only his law through the Ten Commandments, but especially his mercy and grace in his promises and the fulfillment of that promise. Jesus made a statement, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it again. Now, the people got really upset. It took us 42 years to build this temple, and you're going to destroy it in three days and raise it again? Come on. That's blasphemy. So what did he mean? 
What temple is he talking about? His body. His own life. And how is it destroyed? At the cross. He gives it to be broken for us. He dies for us. He's buried for us. Unfortunately, we have a God of grace and mercy. And he rises. In three days, a prophecy using the temple, the very present place of God where the promise was made, but now he makes that promise in his own body, literally. Today, I'd like you to take out page five as we work through the text. There's a number of points that talk about the characteristics of the Christian, those who belong to the family of faith. The first one in verse three, faith that links us to Jesus Christ. We always thank God because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. What is the Bible's definition of faith from Hebrews? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But it's certainly not blind faith. It's a faith built on the promises that God has already kept. You and I are really privileged. Look at all the promises God kept. He said he would send the Messiah. He did. He said that he would live for us. He did. He would die for us. He did. He would rise for us. He did. That he would give the church the Holy Spirit to lead and guide them. He did. We live in that end time. And the last promise, the world will end. And I will call you to myself. For some of us, that may end before the world ends, but the preparation is the same, always being ready in our hearts and lives for when God calls us to his Father's final kingdom. Whenever there's a new life, a baby born, it's our opportunity to help share the good news with them, to increase the kingdom. It's our task. Christians should have children to bring into the world in order that the Christian population can increase. God saved us, not by works of righteousness we've done, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The second thing you find in verse four, a love that believers have for other believers. We always thank God because you've heard of the love that you have for all the saints. Why is it important that we as Christians bond with one another, care about one another, have compassion for one another? That doesn't negate that we're supposed to reach out to others who don't know the Lord, to others who aren't part of the fellowship. That's important, but we have to stay strong. We have to feel nurtured. We have to know that we're not alone in this concept of the kingdom of God. Now in Paul's time, many of those Christians felt very alone. So they looked forward to times they could get together to affirm the faith, to remember they were Christians in this world and that they had other people praying for them as Martha shared in the service, other people on their side to reaffirm their faith so they wouldn't get separated because the devil likes to separate us some of you don't go to church a whole lot. That's dangerous. You can get separated and then lose the tenets of the faith and lose those things that are important, the nourishment of God's word and sacrament, the fellowship of other people, to get involved in others caring about one another and to say, I will be part of that ministry to work together in God's kingdom so that I can affirm those in God's kingdom. Thirdly, he wants us to bear fruit. Some of this is around verse six. We love because he first loved us. And over all the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. 
Bearing fruit can come in many different directions. As you or I forgive someone, especially if the world says, oh, you don't have to forgive them, they wronged you. But if you forgive, it becomes a testament that you really take seriously what God has done for you and me. He forgave us. He loves us with an everlasting love. The least I can do is forgive someone else, even if they wronged me, even if they don't want forgiveness. When a person in a village learns the love of Jesus, can't wait to travel to the hut next door or the village down the path. He's learned how to bear fruit immediately because he feels the joy of salvation. Sometimes when we're second, third, fourth generation Christians, we lose the sense of urgency of telling and talking. This coming weeks, you as youth and counselors, you're going to encounter 25,000 people who are saying, I love Jesus, and we really want to work for him. And you'll build up a crescendo of saying, we want to. Keep praying that that continues and you bring that home to our congregation. We need that enthusiasm among the youth, middle-aged, us older people. We all need that. And you can plant many seeds here. So don't think your journey ends when you arrive back here. That's when your journey begins. And you'll have some duties and responsibilities to help us be regenerated in the faith. And maybe there's times we can help you as we stay connected to bear fruit. Fruit for repentance. It's great to see the fruit grow. Look at that goodness window and those three men's getting along together. It's from Psalm 133. The Lord says, it's great when brothers are together in the faith. Something similar to that. The fourth characteristic we look at is continued prayer for spiritual wisdom. When Solomon was allowed to become king, God said, you can pray about anything you want. Do you know what Solomon prayed for? Discernment, wisdom, understanding. God said, you are on track. Solomon, you understand what it's going to take to be king. When was the kingdom of Israel at its strongest point? In Solomon's time, rich and wealthy, involved in trade, had many copper mines, horses, ships, international trade of its time, fruits and vegetables, agricultural products. They were on the top of the heap. People came to Solomon because he was a man of wisdom and order, and he knew how to run his kingdom. They wanted to learn from him because God blessed him because he was looking in the right direction for God's wisdom. You and I can pray for wisdom, understanding, discernment. What would you have us to do, Lord? How am I to be involved in your kingdom? How do I use the gifts that you gave to me? And all of us have them. How do you use the opportunities, the places I'm planted in my world of being a student, being a worker, being retired, being in a club? How do you use me, Lord, to be a witness to you? He's given us opportunities, and we can pray for wisdom to make use of those opportunities. You've heard the statement, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You like that statement? That can really be comforting, can really be a sense of confidence. Some days it can be hard to say. All things work together for good for those who love God. A loss occurs, a difficult challenge, a temptation. All things can work together for good for those who love God. But in the meantime, you and I have to stand firm in the faith. We have to be God's people looking for him to strengthen us so that that love that we have for God can have its result and conclusion. The last thing the Lord tells us in this scripture we're looking at 
that he rescued us in verses 13 and 14 from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his light. He rescued us, he redeemed us, he bought us back, he paid the ransom, and now we're free to be his people, free to live for him, free to know each morning I can wake up and God loves me and gives me a new start, free to know I can keep learning and growing in God's word. We finally pray for this clear understanding of God's rescue because it is the Lord who redeemed us. It is the Lord who forgave my sins. It is the Lord who will be with us when we seek to grow in faith and bear the fruits of faith. It is the Lord who invites us to pray and promises to hear us. We live in a world that needs tremendous amount of prayer. Lots of action to bring unity among people, to treat people as important, no matter what the skin color or their background, to find a way to live at peace. And you as a younger generation have a lot of opportunities in school to build that foundation of working together with one another, finding those common bases. In our Christian community, we need to find that commonness among Christian congregations. Certainly we have differences in denominations, but we also have a central focus of Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior. May he give us the strength and especially the wisdom to look for his guidance and peace. And may the peace of God that transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for prayer. We lift up our souls to you, Lord. Thank you for your truth. Enable us to be faithful, Lord, in your mercy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and delight at all times and in all places. Give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup. When he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Welcome to the Lord's table. May his body and his blood, which is given and shed for you, strengthen you and keep you faithful to life everlasting Go in peace. Grant, O oh Lord, that your Son's body and blood, which you've given us to eat and drink, may abide in us, 
let no stain of sin remain in us, whom this pure and holy sacrament has refreshed. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.